The Liber Chaotica by Marijan von Stauffer and Richard Williams Read by the Chaos Druid Black Crusades. The sky will tear. Machines will cross the stars. The legions will return. The still beating heart of mankind will be sacrificed to sate the hunger of the blood god. This morning, I awoke to feel as though I had been asleep for an eternity, and yet still, I can barely hold my eyes open. The same dreams return to haunt me, night after night. Most are too terrible to recount. Others I cannot ignore, because they seem relevant to my task. I find my mind wanders, and days pass without me being able to recall what I did with them. I wander the halls of the scriptorium, and in the closed-in walls I am imprisoned by the rooms that are stacked with ramparts of books and papers, walls within walls within prisons, and my fragile mind. I believe that no man should have to do the job with which I have been charged. We are not made from strong enough stuff to defend against the insidious powers. I weaken by the minute. My visions are frequent now, and not visited upon me by my lack of sleep. They seem so real, but when I try to remember them, I cannot focus, and my thoughts slide back to the task at hand, cataloging the obscenity of the worship of the unnameable foe. I envy everyone else their station in life against that which I do, but I must remind myself that it is for the good of all mankind and the empire that I attempt it. I must maintain my vigilance in my work, and I pray that whatever assails my mind and body allows me to complete it before I am lost. Sometimes I write for hours without respite, I write with conviction, but after I remember not where the thoughts came from. I read back over what I put to paper, and what I see frightens me to the pit of my soul. Such as it scares me to say this, I don't know what any of it means. A tear in the sky. So it will occur that the eye torn in the sky will weep blood and the legions that dwell there in a state of constant warfare will spill out, united under a single leader, and once again assail the bedrock of humankind. There will be an unholy union between each and every faction and region of the infernal eye, and untold millions of heretics and thousands of craft will seek to burst through the stalwart defenses placed there in readiness for the event. These invasions one every hundred generations will prove gigantic, and if they are not stymied, I cannot see the final outcome, then surely they will bring mankind to its knees. The alliance for these grand assaults will be welded together by a terrible overlord of chaos, perhaps demon, perhaps mortal. These tidal waves of destruction will occur in a time of our darkest insecurity, where the fate of humanity hangs by the merest of threads. I see the peril, and hope mankind can weather the violence of the end times. They will occur as written. The Primary Roar of the Abandoned One And the fallen will band together, and herald one among them is king. For four hundred years and more the eye will sleep. It will be assumed that those inside have torn themselves apart and left themselves as little more than barbarians, struggling and clawing at one another on those worlds upon which they have been stranded. These assumptions will be proven mistaken, and the price will be dear. The traitor legions will return, and at their head the abandoned one will scream his blood cry. He will lead the legions of black 
and rekindle ambitions to force the empire of mankind to bend knee before chaos and lament before his might. This invasion will demonstrate little of the subtlety and malevolent brilliance that he will later show, but in this endeavor he will learn much to aid him in future times. Toward the heart of humanity will his forces be driven, in the hopes to accomplish where his thrice damned forebearers have failed. Wherever the crusade passes will be left burnt cinders and shattered husks devoid of life forevermore. But, as they will do both before and after, and in a manner eerily reminiscent of the dark days, the guardians of the Imperium, priests of the machine, and giant warriors in gleaming armor who bring purity and death in equal measure, the chapters of the Astartes, will march forth together, and as one, turn the abandoned one back, but not until a bitter struggle has been waged, and one too close to the beating heart of mankind for fears to ever be assaged. It will be on this incursion to the Forbidden Hills on Uralan that the Abandoned One will lay claim to the sword that imprisons the essence of Drakinian. Of how he obtained such an item, I cannot see. The Second Crusade of the Abandoned One The Eye will close on the King of Blood, and a fortress will rise to contain him. After dashing the assault on mankind's bastion of strength, he who sits on the golden throne will turn his efforts to contain the threat. The fortress of Cadium will be built, and savage Lupin warriors will guard it with many others whose names, in time, will be forgotten. The bastion will be considered insurmountable, and for a time will prove so. Other such places will be planned. The naval port of Bellus Corona and the castle of Nemesis Tessera will be the foundation blocks on which any other incursions from the terrible eye is to break like a wave. When these measures are completed, all will wait, with breath abated, to see how they will fare when the eye will once again open. They will wait nearly three hundred years. But the abandoned one will not falter yet. Indeed, his allies and sponsors will rally around him in ever greater numbers, and his second assault will be every bit as strong and direct as the first. This time, however, the defenders will bear the brunt prepared. Savage fighting and unholy slaughter will erupt at the moment the invasion storms the Cadium walls and continue until its cost conclusion five years later. In the meantime, the evil forces, once stymied at Cadium, will spill out from either side and begin rampaging where they can. But the preparations will prove sh to be strong, and a new hope will burn in the hearts of men. The abandoned one's hammer blow will ring hollow, and he will retreat back to smolder an ire. The Hosts of Talamine in an age of apostasy, the wolf warriors bay and howl. Talamin, prince among demon princes, will lead an attack, but the outcome is hazy and the events indistinct to me. The only thing I know with certainty is that the wolf warriors will play a large part in Talamin's destruction. Whether he will be eternally banished or will yet rise again, I cannot see. The Fourth Crusade of the Abandoned One, and the Devastation of Elfenor. In the Fourth Insurgents, the horror will be spliced with fire. And again, his legions will sweep forth, possessed of a renewed fervor. Cadium's walls will be besieged, and the Blood King is to personally lead the fleet towards the Segmentum Emptiness. But at Elfenor, the Citadel of Cromark, the drive will halt, but the abandoned one, terrible amidst his wrathful hordes, will lead the charge against the stolid walls. His warriors will fall like leaves, but the fortress will crumble, and the defenders be consumed by his boundless appetite. The life and sanity of that beleaguered place is to be washed away in an orgy of annihilation. But these sinful excesses will prove his undoing, 
given, as they will, men time to regroup and exact a well-planned revenge on the disarrayed forces of evil that infest the ruins of the once-proud castle of Cromark. The Dark Ones will be shredded to rags by their own violent indulgence. The Tide of Blood An ancient prince of corn named Doombreed will sweep humanity's finest and purest to the brink of destruction. Few will fall if compared with other invasions, but the cost will be high indeed. His war will be nothing less than a declaration of war upon the Adeptus, staunchest of all the foes of chaos, and he will be defeated. But I lament the Warhawks and the Venerators, for they shall be lost. Black Crusades in the Age of Strife And men will bare their breasts and invite destruction to take them. Apostasy will reign for many years, and the eye will cast forth countless harbingers of death. I cannot guess at how many crusades will be launched during these dark days, but the abandoned one will return, this I know, and men will grow mistrustful of each other, and cosmic forces of tremendous power will isolate and disenfranchise our strongholds and citadels, and the ever-watchful dark will fall upon us and our weakness and seek to destroy us, and much ruin will be caused. But our end will not come here, not yet a while. The Abandoned One's Seventh Crusade, the Ghost War. For the seventh time, he comes as Shadow. Comes the time called the Ghost War. The Abandoned One's fleet will flood in a heavy tide from the gates of Cadium, and then disappear. There will follow years of hunt and seek, and confusion and paranoia, and disinformation and deceit. Raids will occur in far-flung places. His hand becomes night, and his standards secure. He will fall through the eye to prepare. Man will wait for the outcome, with dread like a vice around his heart. The Abandoned One's Tenth Crusade the Conflict of Helica. At the Medusa's walls, the Iron Guards will break. By accident or design, the Merdacious fleet is to emerge from the opposing side of the Terrible Eye to the Cadium Gate, in a place known as Helica. Men will guard this place with hands girt in iron, and the very chapter kith themselves. Savage attacks on Helica will prevail, burning towards the capital. Thracian Primus. Yet, there his assault will fatally be delayed, as his warriors of iron clash with the iron-handed ones at sturdy Medusa. What will occur in that engagement, my lord has not gifted me to see. The Abandoned One's Twelfth Crusade. The Gothic War. At the time of the Twelfth, all things will be decided. It is at this time that his great plans will seem at last to bear fruit. Mighty blows will fall at Gethsemane and Skildengeist, and the warrior Ravensburg will carry the day. But mankind will reel from the Blood King's assault, and he will escape with black stone, and the ruin of man is further assured. The first struggle for the heart of Armageddon. And Angron will rise to challenge men, and curse them and eat their world. Leading a train of traitors and legion of demons, they will blast out from the eye's red pupil. They will appear as if from nowhere in an ancient vessel of indescribable proportions at Armageddon that already falters from its own mischief. The land will be turned into a cauldron, but once again the Lupine warriors and knights in grey lead a sally to rout the deadly foe. The mortal shell of Angron himself will be destroyed, and he will be cast back into the infernal realms. Berserkers Legions of traitors have left their kin and succumbed to the blood call of corn. Their coming will herald a new age of apostasy, 
and a darkness that will not break. They will fall from the sky, and fire will be their greeting. They travel the heavens, girded completely in armor, so that no part of their body is visible. They burn with a great incandescence in their eyes that doth mirror the burning hatred in their hearts. They feel not for us but the deepest contempt, and strive at nothing more than the eradication of good from the world. They are the traitor legionaries, the fallen Astartes, black stars in the night sky that bleeds in its own shade of blood. Of all of the god demons of chaos, it is corn that has the greatest sway over the traitor legionaries' hearts. This is not surprising. Corn is the bloody god of warriors, and the Astartes are the ultimate warriors. Fully an entire legion that is named the Eaters of Worlds was devoted itself to Korn's worship, and indeed every other legion has its members who have forsworn their original loyalties to sink into his bloody veneration. Their fellows shun such legionaries, for upon the battlefield the bloodlust will grip them so hard that they are as likely to turn upon their comrades as cut a bloody swathe through the enemy. Now there is little distinction between the original world eaters and those from other legions who bear the same blasphemy, and so they are all known as corn berserkers. Some ancient event caused the eaters of worlds to splinter. No longer do they travel as a legion, or as companies, or with any discipline or order, but rather they have formed into war bands under their champions. These war bands vary in size from a few individuals to hundreds of warriors. They chart their own destiny, attaching themselves to the raiding fleets of other legions, or simply making their home upon one of the ancient sea hulks, and leaving their destination up to the whims of fate. Only a being of awesome power and authority, such as Doombreed or Angron himself, could ever forge the berserkers back together again as anything resembling a legion. These gruesome fiends favor close combat blades crafted deep in the hell forges of the eye, swords that scream, and axes with swift rotating blades set into the head. They all cry forth to their bearer, for their never-ending thirst is to be slaked in blood. Competition to be first into the fray and the first to kill for the blood god is fierce, and they are known to fall upon their own weapons should they be denied a blood sacrifice for their patron god. Their armor, a warped and desecrated version of the powerful armor of the noble Astartes, bears the colors of their lord, red, black, and brass, and all are affixed with further icons of devotion or trophies of the slain. The right gauntlet is often painted red, supposedly as another symbol of corn. The original colors of the Eaters of Worlds are still visible on some items, often a shoulder piece, a breastplate, or a single piece of armor has come from one of the Legion's original warriors and has been incorporated within without redecoration. Why they wish to maintain a link to their past is unknown to me. The Berserker is an unnatural and deadly enemy. No plea or bribe could stay his blade from striking. Mercy is nothing to them, the concept entirely alien. Their ranks are manifold, and their strength is incalculable. I understand them not. But I have seen them. Soon they may see me. And then I will die. Cults of corn. Being a recount of things to be, and what I see will come to fruition, and it will be rotten and foul, and will swell with disease, and pollute all the ground. Cults exist. They may exist anywhere. They may be acting out debauched ceremonies on the lodging next door. You may be a member yourself, an unknowing, or knowing, worshipper of the black faith. Inquisitors and witch hunters work and fight during the day or night, but they are but a crumbling breakwater against which the growing tide of the foolish seduced who enter into the unholy packs and ensnare others to follow them to damnation. The breakwater will one day collapse, and the dark lords will run riot through our lands, with the ignorant multitudes cavorting at their feet. The Kith, the Sapensia. The Kith 
will be born from the underclass of the vast city called Sapensia, which will teem like a hive in the far-flung place called Sabat. And from this birth one will rise to dubious eminence, and he will be called Shalian Skara. Shalian Skara will be infamous for the Baham murder camps, where, by him, will be killed an obscene number of inhabitants. But after the Most Holy Crusade took that place, he will flee to Sapentia, and there the kith will be waiting for him. There he will incite them to action. They will overthrow the Imperia's rule, butcher all who remain loyal, and seize supplies destined for the Most Holy Crusade. In doing so, Shalin will hope to force an attack by the Imperia's guard forces of the Crusade, and thereby further add to the death and slaughter that he will worship with such fervent lust. The Holy Guard will oblige, and, in an assault upon Oskre Island, crush his forces. But Shalin will have one final play. As soon as he knows the battle is lost, he will give an order of mass suicide to his followers. Such is his grip upon the minds of the kith that they will obey without question, and more than ten thousand of them will take their own lives in praise of corn. Sholin himself will not be killed, but rather try to escape, and as Sigmar wills, or will not, be taken by the Imperia's holy guard. The Manskinner a bloody deal with the Dark Powers will be bartered by one who will become known as the Manskinner to facilitate his escape from Aperia's just captivity. This he will do, but the price will be high. He will lose his arm in the escapade, but the Dark Ones will replace the limb with a mutation of grotesque appearance, and he will take it as a sign of favor and dedicate himself to corn. He will prove a powerful and magnetic orator, who will corrupt any who listen to him closely. At Gethalamor, the man-skinner will earn his name by flaying those who oppose him and running their skin up flagpoles. After such atrocities, the Templars of Sable will move to hunt him down. They will succeed in bringing him to battle at Imperian's Gate. There, a small contingent of Templars of Sable will win a famous victory over the man-skinner's horde, destroying it utterly. Those who live, those whose lives he helped destroy, will flay the skin from his flesh and display it around the towns. The Bringers of Corn In the hour after his birth, Bloody Corn will pit eight fearsome champions and have them clash in single combat until only one remains, and he will be Corn's chosen. And other mortals will seek to emulate this ritual, seeking far and wide great warriors to pit themselves against and destroy all others who stand in their way. And when one seeks to join their bestial ranks, he will be matched with eight others, such hopefuls, whom they train in the ways of battle, until finally they will be matched off against one another. Only one will survive to be initiated into the cult. This combination of martial pride and ultimate betrayal is said to please Korn well. The fists of Imperia claim to have destroyed a temple of them on Oridus and further defeated many of their warriors individually down through the centuries, but they will never be fully expunged. The Blood Kin In the Most Holy Crusade for Sabat, in the fight for the Gap, the merchant clans of Illaroyanus, after years of heavy tithing, will finally snap and revolt. The suppression of this uprising will be famous in the histories of Imperia. The insurgent armies, constituting a great number of men, will seize the governor's palace, the cargo docks, and curtain wall defenses of the city, casting out all Imperia's officers and thereafter declaring their independence from fair Imperia. Only the arbitrators stationed there will show any resistance at all, and while they will fight to the last, they will be only a few hundred against a host. The high command of the Gap Crusade cannot ignore such a loss of his supplies, and thus he will reroute a detachment of the Crusade to quell the rebels. The force will consist of several segments of Oxir stalkers, feral tribesmen who have been recruited into the Holy Guard, and who will survive mainly through unparalleled brutality upon the field. 
much of the worst of the Gap Crusade. The defenders of Ilaronos will prove little match for these hardened and battle-seasoned soldiers, and with lightning strikes, the guard generals will bring the rebels to their knees in a matter of days with a minimum loss of life and resources. Detachments of stalkers will be positioned around the city to disarm and hold the rebel forces, while the Holy Guard's commander, General Vincesnius Polsk, will graciously accept the Ilronians' formal surrender. But this is not the end of my foretelling. It will be at this very ceremony that the Commissar Klein, attached to the Oxier regiments, will step forward and declare the acceptance of the surrender to be heresy of the highest order. With ruthless and swift efficiency, he will summarily execute Polsk and his staff and assume command, wherein he will decree that the rebel forces should be utterly annihilated. The stalkers around the city will obey with great fervor, flooding with Elrorians in their own prisons or simply dragging them from their cells and beheading them with their Quixirian ritual battle swords. Such is the danger if you swell the ranks of your army with such barbaric savages. It will come apparent that the Quixarian faith, which will have been previously sanctioned as a bloody but beneficial worship of the Golden Emperor, will in fact be something far darker. Klein, assigned to ensure their loyalty, will be tainted himself, but how this happens I cannot fathom. Klein and the Quixarian regiments will leave the shattered El Rowans before news of his treachery can reach the Crusade fleets. They will remain at large and call themselves the Blood Kin, and much destruction will be brought by their swift and deadly strikes. The War Herd In the fifth dawn of summer, when the rain falls black with hate, the War Herd will descend. Their feral beliefs of culling the poor to replace them with their blood will garner them a following from the furthest reaches of the world. All will tremble before them, but the markings of a poor man will serve to be his undoing. They will worship corn in their way, offering up the slain for his delectation, and moving on to the next place to be ravaged and spoiled. They see their leader clearly sometimes, his face a mass of battle scars, and his body adorned with many items of precious gold and vain jewels, all red, as to resemble drops of blood as they run in threads down his armor. They will never be caught. They will kill forever. Renegades A study of the traitor legions, whose corruption shines out like a beacon of darkness, even amongst the depraved followers of the blood god. The traitor legions be not the only forces at the wrathful beck and call of chaos. They be not even the smallest fraction of the numbers that the Dark Gods command. Far aside from the hundreds of billions of mortals that slave beneath their rule within the terrible eye, they have countless other followers in places as yet untouched by man in the wider realms of the sky. The warp extends and permeates through all things and peoples, and wherever a man can think an evil thought, there too are the Dark Gods beside him. Many such followers will be blind as to the ghoulish reality of the beasts they worship. Stone Age barbarians worship their tribal gods, or noble deleticians in vast cities with spires that reach into the stars turn to anything to relieve the boredom of their existence. The powers care little for such followers, for they be mere mortals driven by their own mortal weaknesses, without the talent or the ambition to truly achieve anything that would be noticed in this vast space. Yet some differ. Some have gained true knowledge of the powers and covet the abilities and vision with which they may see the potential in foul worship. Men and women such as these be determined to dedicate their lives to these depraved and decadent gods, not in a haphazard or mundane fashion, but completely, utterly, and with, divine, with driven intent. Their return? Reward. To ultimately join the powers of mortal servants as a demon prince. Vile lords will reward the most powerful, but just as easily they will be gleefully damned than to eternal oblivion to be a subhuman monstrosity. 
all vicious primarchs of the perfidious legions, all those that lived and escaped the death they deserved, have been raised as this. Hateful and baleful they be, and regard the human race with an eye jaundiced with envy, and they do covet our destruction. I brand them thus, renegades. In the cold reality, they are as widely diverse as the spawn of chaos that gibber and whimper in their ecstatic perversion and do puke forth from the orb in the sky. They infiltrate every corner and remote bastion that humanity clings to like sand on a rock. And the tide cometh. I have felt it rise o'er my head and by Sigmar I am drowning in it. Such is all our fates. Dreaded craft ply all seas, filled with dreadful creatures that thirst ever for blood, rotting, rusting, but held together by some unseen and insidious power that I cannot understand, with crews and retinues of dark followers, mutants and misfits, such a hulk is a danger for all. They drift on the whims and fancies of the great sea that covers the worlds and all others, and when they fall out near habitation, doom is near. Renegades often lie hid in the center of the secret coven networks. They nestle like disease in the midst of craven worshippers, fawning supporters and deceitful informers, manipulating all those they can into the service of chaos. Such renegades may command the power to lead armies of followers, to summon demons through blasted rituals, and instill fear in many of their mere presence. These twisted personages may be mortal, but they provide great use to corn and reap the corrupting benefits of his notice and favor. But the complexities of the true nature of such covens are deep, and my mind is riven with doubt regarding their true impact into our domain. All I know for certain is that they pose a grave danger, and every cranny and nook must be searched with the light of righteous vengeance. <laughs>